Welcome to the Embarcadero Field Service Industry Template, which is a RAD server solution. In this demo video, we are going to cover the Field Service Server Resource and Module for RAD Server. You can deploy it in IIS on Windows, Apache on Windows or Linux, or the standalone RAD Server EMS Server on Windows or Linux. So, currently, if you do not have the Field Service Industry Template, you can go to the Tools menu and bring up the Get It Package Manager, go to the Industry Templates category, and you can download it here. I've already downloaded it, so I don't need to do that. And then I have my Field Service Server project open already. I'll show you which directory it's located in. So it gets downloaded when you use the, the Get It Package Manager, it gets downloaded here. You've got your four projects. There's also other videos that cover these other projects on how to set them up and how they work. And then inside this main directory, there will be the help file. There's two PDF files that explain in, in a lot of detail how everything works together. So I've got my project open already. We have two units in this project. We have the U-Tenant module unit and we have the U-Field Service unit. So the U-Tenant module unit provides a REST endpoint for the lists of tenants and so when you open up your Field Service Admin and your Field Service App Client you'll see that there is a branch ID selection box and that selection box downloads its list of branch IDs or tenants from this REST endpoint. It's very simple, it just has this one git function in it and it does a select on the tenants and returns the tenant ID and tenant name. So then we're going to move over here to the U field service unit and we're going to we're going to investigate this unit a little bit. So we've got our FD connection for interbase. We have our interbase driver link component. We have our JSON link component. And this, so this JSON link component is necessary because we want to save out our fire DAC data sets to JSON and having that allows us to do that. So we have some table components here. We have our FD appointments table. We have our FD parts table and our FD technicians table. So those are the three main tables that are in the server side interbase database for the RAD server field service server. Some, we have some other queries that happen here, and so we're going to go through the code here a little bit and explain it and, and talk about it. So up here at the top we have a define that turns on group permissions. There's group permissions in the server, and the server has two different groups by default. It has a manager's group and an employee's group, and the manager's group allows you to log into the field service admin app, and then the, the technician's group allows or the employee's group allows you to log into the field service app client which you would run on mobile devices. So we have a resource name here of field service and then we have lots of different functions for the various endpoints defined and here's our, our different endpoints which are defined. So we have some constants here at the top with, with what I just talked about with a managers group and the technicians group and so if you for whatever reason change your groups names in RAD server you also need to change these constants to match those groups. For if you would like your permissions to work the same across everywhere. So we're going to scroll down here to one of the main functions in the field service server and that is the git endpoint. So the git endpoint it handles three different endpoints here. It handles the appointments endpoint, the parts endpoint, and the technicians endpoint. So what it does is it returns the data or the records from each of those tables to via a REST endpoint to the requesting client. And so there is the documentation that I talked about and in the documentation it has this list of endpoints that you can see if you would like to use other clients to request this data from this field service server. So as we just saw in this git function there's the at appointments, the parts, and the technicians endpoints and so on the appointments endpoints, if you are a manager user, then you will receive all of the appointments when you make a request to that endpoint. But if you are a technician, you're in the technicians group, you will only receive the current day appointments for that user account. So if there's an appointment and it's assigned to your technician account and it's the current day, then you will see that appointment in your list of results when you hit that endpoint. Uh, so for the, the parts endpoint, there is no permissions on that one. Everybody receives all the list of parts when you hit that endpoint. And then with the technician's endpoint, if you are a manager, 
you will receive a list of all of the users, but if you're a technician, you'll only receive your own account in that the record results when you hit that endpoint. And so ne next up, we're going to look at the post endpoints. And so there's four post endpoints. There's a post endpoint for appointments, parts, technicians, and finally there's a post endpoint for updating an appointment record. So let's talk about those first three ones that I mentioned. So there's the appointments post endpoint. And so with the appointments post endpoint, it is utilized by the field service admin app. And so the field service admin app can hit that endpoint and it can create new appointments or it can edit an existing appointment. So both of those functions happen through that single endpoint using the post function there. And then we also have the parts endpoint and the technician's endpoint. So the parts and the technician's endpoint, they behave very similar to the appointments that I just talked about. When the field service admin app hits either of those endpoints, it can add or edit records to those record sets. And finally, the fourth endpoint here, the field service update appointment endpoint. This endpoint is for the field service app client, and it allows a technician in the field with their app client to write a note on an appointment and change its status. So they can change its status from pending to complete. And so once they change it from pending to complete and they add their little note there, they, they make send that update to the server, it hits this endpoint, and those changes are made within the server interface database. And finally, the last three endpoints we're going to talk about here are the de three delete endpoints, and these are, are simply a delete endpoint for the appointments table, the parts table, and the technicians table. And only the managers can hit these endpoints from the field service admin app. And that's what the permissions does for all of these different endpoints is that it segments the permissions on who, which, which ad, RAD server group can hit which endpoint. And once they do hit that endpoint, what data is returned when they do do that? So let's go back to the code here now in the field service unit. And so we looked at we looked at the the get endpoint here, and then we saw how it takes the the endpoint text there segment and it sends it finds out which one it is and it sends it off to these different get functions here and then we're going to and then finally if there is no results or whatever then it will return some json and in this case it's an empty table so then we're going to scroll down we're going to see here's the post that we just talked about in the documentation here's the post function that handles the post endpoint and so we can see here is the update appointment endpoint and it sends it off to the update appointment function and then finally if you're a manager you can see that here is the appointments post endpoint and it sends it off to post appointments post parts and post technicians and finally down here on the delete item endpoint you can see that if you're a manager here's the appointments endpoint and it goes to delete appointments parts endpoint goes delete parts and technicians goes to delete technicians so those are how the endpoints interact with the functions. We're going to scroll up here to these functions and, and dig into them a little bit and see how they work. So what I'd like to get to is I'd like to find in the code here, I think I almost got it. We've got the get appointments function. So the get appointments function, you can see how the code moves through here. We've got some SQL strings and we have an SQL query string. So we kind of build the SQL query string here. And we use permissions to do that. If they're a technician, we do a certain thing. If they're a manager, we do something else. And then finally, you'll see in this one, so we do a select from the appointments table in the interbase database. And we also utilize that tenant ID that I've talked about to make sure that we only receive data for the specific tenant ID that we're connecting to the server as. So once once that's been established, then we, we run our permissions SQL, and then we do our order by and, and other SQL queries there. Finally, we make those we make those calls, we set those parameters here, the tenant ID, and then we save the results of that FD query via save to stream as JSON back out to the results for that endpoint. These other endpoints that get parts, they they 
work very similar. You can see that they save out, they do a select here, add via FD query component, and then they return the results as JSON. The same goes for technicians. Now technicians are a little bit trickier. It's got some custom code in here that the other two didn't have. It does a check to see if the use if which user it is and it changes their last login field in the technicians database to the current timestamp. So that's one of the things it does and then it also changes does some permissions here where I talked about where the, if the user is is a technician then they only receive the list then they only receive their own record and not the list of all users. But if they're a manager they'll receive the list of all users. So here you can see it's very similar to the the previous functions I talked about. Uh, it does the select of the technicians table and it re does using the tenant ID filter and returns that result via JSON. So if we go back up here to these other functions that were near the top we have the update appointment function. So the update appointment function it has a synced field and then it, it updates the notes field and the status field with the information that is sent up from the field service app client. And then let's see other other functions here for the, that correspond with the other endpoints. We have the post appointments endpoint function. And so if we if we drop to this, we'll see that if you upload a ID of zero, then it's going to create a new record. Otherwise, if you upload an existing ID that's already in the table, then it's going to simply edit that record. And the code here is very simple. It it, it detects whether it's a zero or not here in the top, and then once it is, it, the, the rest of the code is pretty much the same regardless of whether it is an edit or a add. And the other three, the other two functions, the post parts and the post technicians work very similarly as well. They both detect whether it's a zero or an existing record, and they do the corresponding function. And that's pretty much it for the code here. There, there's only about maybe a little bit under a thousand lines of code for this whole field service server. And if you'd like to see the other videos, be sure to check out the other videos on how to set up the field service industry template. And then there's also videos for the field service admin app and the field service app client. Now, one more thing though, is we're going to run this here and then you'll see all right, so now we, we, when we ran this, we loaded up the RAD server development server, and you will see that we have this field service server.bpl file loaded up. So that it's as simple as that to run your server, and now the server is, is waiting on port 8080 for you to connect and access those endpoints that we just reviewed. And finally, you can also run that dev server here from the RAD Studio bin directory and I'll run that as you can see I've already got one running on 8080 so it wasn't able to open up again. That's it for this video. Be sure to check out the other videos and thanks for watching.